Libertarianism is pro-immigration, pro-market, pro-trade. More competitive, less centralized. Not military confrontations, but peaceful interaction. The war on drugs has been actually an unmitigated disaster. I reported, I reported that, that from 1999 through 2013, through 2013 uh, there, there were an average of 21 mass shootings, shootings in the U.S. annually, far, far fewer than the number of days in the year. And by, and by the way, eight of those were killings within a family, family. Nine, nine others were associated with drug, drug, drug deals and gang warfare. warfare. Only, Only four, four of the 21, 21 on average per year, year were these, these mass public, public shootings like the recent uh, Parkland, Parkland uh, now, I don't, now, I don't mean, mean to trivialize four mass, mass murders. It's a horrible, horrible thing. thing. Uh, but, uh, but some, some of the rhetoric has quite clearly uh, been, uh, been uh, grossly overblown. overblown. So, so let me, let tell, me you tell you about the good news. news. Uh, uh, since since peaking in the early 1990s, 1990s a gun, uh, gun ha ha homicide has declined, declined by half nationwide. nationwide. Overall gun crime victimization, not just homicide, homicide all, all victims of gun violence, is down by three-fourths since the 1990s. School shootings are also down. Now, now during that, that same period, period our gun supply, supply grew by 80 million guns. There's now, now more than one gun, gun per person in the United States. States. More than 300 and some million guns in the United, United States. States. So, so guns, guns way, way up, up, killings, at least, at least since, since 1990, uh, way, way down. down. Interestingly, the Department, Department of Education reports that there, there are 50 million kids that attend, that attend public schools for an, for an average, average of 180, 180 days per year. year. Since, Since the, the, the first, first of these horrible, horrible, horrible mass, mass killings, killings that's Columbine, Columbine 1999, there have been 200 students shot to death, death uh, during, during school. school. So, so if, if you, you do, do the math, math 50, 50 million kids, 180, 180 days per year, year. Since, since 1999, the likelihood of a student, of a given student being killed by a gun in school on any given day is roughly 1 in 614 million. So, so yes, yes, it could, could be, be your, your kid. kid. Uh, but, but he or she faces a much higher risk, risk traveling, traveling to and from, from school or catching, catching a potentially deadly disease in school. school. Or, or suffering a life-threatening life injury playing interscholastic sports. And, and in fact, about 120 times more kids are shot outside of school than, than are shot in school. school. So, so, again, again without, without trivializing these horrible, horrible incidents, we, we do tend to overestimate the risks associated with these mass shootings. We also, we also tend, to tend to overestimate the risks associated with accidental deaths. deaths. Out, Out of 40, 40 million, million kids under, under the age of 10, 10 there, there were 20 accidental deaths in a recent year. year. Young, Young children are 40 times more likely to die from suffocation, 30 times more likely to drown, 20 times more likely to, drown, times more likely to, drown, to die in, in fires. Now, now it, it is true that statistics like that have to be viewed with caution. First, First because, because the source can be ideologically motivated, and second, because it's very difficult to hold, hold all the variables constant and focus only on the variable that you're, you're interested in. And gun-related statistics, uh, they, they, they present, present special problems. Uh, for, for example, uh, the, the most widely cited data on, on, on gun deaths includes, includes suicides. That's, that's the largest component of gun-related deaths. Two thirds of gun-related deaths are suicides. But if, but if we're, we're talking about banning assault, assault rifles or banning, banning high-capacity high magazines, magazines, suicide statistics are beside the point. They, they are irrelevant because, because no one is going to be deterred from killing themselves uh, because that person only has a handgun. Two, Two other problems. problems. First, First, data on gun-related gun crimes should include, include only those crimes that are committed with guns, guns that, that are currently legal. It's, it's logically circular to argue that a weapon should be banned by quoting data on crimes that are committed with a weapon that's already banned. And second, if we are concerned about crimes committed using a gun, we have to balance that concern by counting the crimes that are deterred because someone has a gun. And that is difficult because guns are most often used defensively by brandishing them, not by firing them. Still, the estimates are that there are about a half a million gun crimes annually uh, in the United States. And according to Florida State uh, University criminologist Gary Kleck, who, by the way, favors more gun controls, uh, there are four times more, roughly two million, 
defensive uses of guns. And bear in mind, if we have more than 300 million guns in circulation, which we now do, even if you used a different gun in each of those half million crimes, which obviously is not the case because many crimes are committed with the same gun, even if you used a different gun, that would mean that 99.8% of guns in the U.S. are not involved uh, in criminal activity. All right, let's look at a few of the uh, gun control proposals that have been uh, uh, been floated. Now, for starters, here's one that seems to be self-evident. Um, keep anyone on a terrorist watch list from getting a gun. Well, what seems obvious isn't quite so simple because of our constitutional requirement for due process. Uh, the terrorist watch list now contains about 800,000 names. There's a smaller subset of that, the no-fly list, which contains roughly 110,000 names. The lists are secretive. They are error prone, they are unaccountable, they are discriminatory, and individuals can be included based solely on suspicion or a hunch. There are actually government guidelines that state, I quote, concrete facts are not necessary. So unless and until we tighten up the list and provide adequate means to challenge and correct mistakes, we should not be arbitrarily denying everyone on the list uh, the right to own a firearm. And that is especially so because the practical effect is going to be negligible. Uh, the GAO reported 23 million background checks in 2015. Of those 23 million, 244 were on the no-fly list. That's one one-thousandth of one percent. And 90 percent of the people that are on the no-fly list are already disqualified from buying guns because they're not citizens and they're not lawful residents. Now, there's a more promising proposal that I'm sure you've heard a lot about. It's garnered wide support, and that's to ban high-capacity magazines. Uh, I can imagine a Korean uh, shop owner in the White Watts riots needing multiple rounds to protect his store and his family. But I can also imagine uh, multiple victim killings, like in Parkland, where innocent lives might have been saved uh, if high-capacity magazines had been effectively banned. So which of those is the weightier a concern. And that's where government has the burden to demonstrate that the benefits of banning high capacity magazines exceed the cost. And if the government meets that burden, I have no doubt that the ban would survive a Second Amendment court challenge. Uh, bear in mind, however, there are four, uh, at least four related problems. One is that homemade magazines are easy to assemble. The second is that murderers can very quickly and easily reload uh, a second or third magazine in a matter of seconds. Third, there is no way to confiscate the millions of high-capacity magazines that are now in circulation. And fourth, many of the existing semi-automatic uh, weapons are configured for 12 to 19 magazines. Uh, and so a ban on any size less than 20 rounds would encounter great uh, resistance from gun owners. Now, that said, uh, I'm not aware of any situation where an actual or a potential civilian victim has had to fire more than 20 rounds in self-defense. Uh, but I am aware that magazines with a capacity of greater than 20 rounds have been used numerous times in these mass killings. And that evidence might be sufficient uh, for government to justify a limit of 20 rounds uh, for magazine size. Uh, what about an assault weapons ban? Another proposal you've heard quite a lot about. After the 90, we had an assault weapons ban 1994 uh, to 2004. After it expired in 2004, here's what the New York Times reported, and I quote, Despite dire predictions that the streets would be awash in military-style military guns, expiration of the assault weapons ban has not set off a sustained surge in sales or caused any noticeable increase in gun crime. Now, again, there are millions of these so-called assault weapons now in circulation, and they are used by millions of Americans for hunting, for self-defense, for target shooting, even for Olympic uh, competition. Criminals use handguns. AR-15s are expensive and they're difficult to conceal. And even if we were to reinstitute the assault weapons ban, how would we deal with millions of these guns that are already owned? So some people think that we should just have a buyback program and that'll get the guns off the, off the streets. Of course, it would be very costly. And furthermore, who would be the sellers of such guns? They would be individuals who wanted the money uh, more than they wanted the firearm. And that would include mostly low-income persons living in high-crime areas who obey the law but need a means to defend themselves. And who would be the people that keep the weapons? 
These would be individuals who valued the firearm more than they valued the money. And that would include criminals and terrorists and mentally deranged people who are not motivated by financial incentives. In the Heller case, Justice Scalia wrote that the Second Amendment would pose no barrier to outlawing weapons that are not in common use and especially dangerous. So clearly, some weapons can be banned, and automatic weapons, the ones that when you pull the trigger, it just keeps firing, those have been essentially banned since 1934. So the task is to identify those semi-automatic weapons where you pull the, the trigger once and it fires once, but you can keep pulling without reloading. <clears throat> semi-automatic weapons, identify those semi-automatic weapons that are not commonly used for lawful purposes and would Im improve public safety uh, if they were banned. I think the 1994 assault weapons ban went too far. But a better crafted, I think limited version uh, with especially dangerous weapons banned uh, would be uh, warranted. And by the way, I supported uh, such a ban uh, on selected military type weapons as well as a cap on magazine size um, five years ago in an article called Reflections on Gun Control uh, by a Second Amendment advocate published in the National Law Journal. So I'm sort of a moderate when it comes to the gun rights uh, community. Um, now what about the clamor to extend background checks to private sales at gun shows? Uh, less than 2% of guns that are used by criminals are bought uh, at gun shows. And that includes sales through licensed dealers. And bear in mind, if you go to a gun show and you buy a gun through a licensed dealer, you are subject to a background check. Any sale through a licensed dealer is subject to a background check. There is a claim that 40% of gun transfers escape checks. That claim is bogus. It was based on a study that was made even before the background check system was fully implemented. And it included gifts and inheritances which nobody is proposing background checks for. So if we properly limited the data just the sales, uh, all but 14% of the guns occur, of the gun sales occur through federally licensed dealers, all of which uh, are subject to uh, checks. The New York Times editorialized, by the way, that the background checks, and this is a quote, prevented nearly 2 million gun sales over a 15 year period. Of course, this is nonsense. <clears throat> There's no way for the New York Times to know uh, how many buyers could not get a gun because violence prone buyers, if they don't pass a background check, that doesn't mean they don't get a gun. Uh, it means that they go to the black market for their purchase or they end up stealing a gun. And here are some interesting figures for the year in which the Heller case uh, was passed. That was 2008. <clears throat> the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS, N-I-C-S, denied 79,000 would-be buyers in that year. How many did they prosecute of the ones that they did not? 105. How many did they convict? 43. That's a conviction rate of five one hundredths of 1%. So either the remaining denials were legitimate purchases and they were unjustly blocked by the NICS system, or if the denials were proper, then 99.95% .95 of these 79,000 rejected applicants escaped punishment. So neither of those conclusions offers very much hope uh, for an expanded system of checks. What it means is we do much better to improve the system that we already have. <clears throat> and by the way, the claim that background checks take just a few minutes is disingenuous. A significant number of checks last 72 hours, which is longer than most gun shows uh, are open. Uh, those, are, those are usually two-day events. And remember that the I in NICS and ICS stands for instant. Instant background checks. So if there were technology, and I think there will be within a matter of a couple of years, if there were technology to facilitate truly speedy background checks, say 24 hours, I personally would have no uh, objection in extending NICS to cover private sales uh, at gun shows. Not because I'm convinced that it would curb violence, but I think it gets us past this particular debate and lets us address some options that might be um, a little more effective. And one of those more effective options would be to improve reporting on prospective gun buyers who are mentally ill. Currently, federal regulations prohibit transferring a firearm or ammunition to any person who is adjudicated as a mental defective, which means that a court determines he's a danger to himself or others, or he lacks capacity to manage his own affairs. 
The only other banned buyers for mental reasons are those committed to a mental institution.